The resurrection of Jesus offers answers to more of the big questions than any other event in history. Does God exist? If so, does he care about us? Is there life after death? Do miracles occur? Can we know what's true? Does life have meaning? How should we live? We had our answers to these questions when a group of women showed up at the tomb of Jesus and were greeted by an angel who said, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. With so many different worldviews competing for attention here in the 21st century, I have to say that having a verifiable miracle and God's stamp of approval at the core of Christianity is like watching a bunch of people scrambling around to find some buried treasure when you've got the missing piece of the treasure map. The piece where X, or rather, a cross, marks the spot. I find it fascinating that atheists dogmatically insist that the message of Christianity is just put your blind faith in our religion, when Christianity, more than any other worldview I'm aware of, has always said, here's how you can know that this is true. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul tells the people of Athens that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So, if Christians proclaim, here's the proof, why do atheists here just believe without any evidence whatsoever? It's as if they're not listening. It's as if hearing they do not hear, and seeing they do not see. But for those with ears to hear, Knowing that Jesus rose from the dead is actually much simpler than many people realize. To know that Jesus rose from the dead, we only need to know two things. One, that he was really dead. And two, that he was alive again later. If Jesus was dead and he was alive again later, I'd say that our atheist friends have a great big Son of God-shaped hole in their worldview. Was Jesus dead? And I mean really dead, not passed out, not in a coma, not in a brief state of cardiac arrest. Was he dead? Yes, yes he was. Now, the new generation of atheists who learn about Christianity primarily from social media may be surprised to learn that there are historical facts about Jesus. They think of Jesus as a mythical figure like Hercules, except that they're much angrier about Jesus for some reason. It's a tragedy of the internet age that positions that would be laughed out of the room at the scholarly level can become quite popular at the internet level by circulating among people who don't know much about anything. At the scholarly level, Jesus mythers are viewed along the same lines as Holocaust deniers. But at the internet level, Every other atheist I run into says, Jesus never existed. Really? Well, what books have you read on this? None, but I watch like three YouTube videos, so I'm obviously far more knowledgeable than every respected scholar on the planet. Meanwhile, even some of the most critical historical Jesus scholars will acknowledge certain facts about Jesus. That he was baptized by John the Baptist, that he had disciples, that he was known as a miracle worker and an exorcist, that he believed he played a crucial role in the coming of the kingdom of God, and, of course, that he died by crucifixion. The scholarly consensus on Jesus' death arises from having a variety of ancient sources. There are Christian, Jewish, and Roman sources reporting Jesus' death, and knowing how crucifixion works. Today, we tend to think of crucifixion as just nailing someone to a cross, but Roman crucifixion was a three-step process. The first step was the scourging, which was sometimes called the half-death, because victims would be half-dead by the time it was finished. 
The Romans used a flagrum made of leather thongs with chunks of bone or metal woven into the strands, designed to remove human flesh. We have records of people being beaten until their veins and arteries were exposed, or until their bones were showing, or until their intestines spilled out. And that was just the beginning. Step two was nailing the victim to a cross and letting him hang there while the blood drained out of him. Once he stopped gasping for breath, the Romans knew their work was done. Almost. The Romans didn't take crucifixion lightly, so there was a third step, some sort of death blow, just to make sure their victim was dead. If they needed to pry someone off a cross, they would smash his head in, or stab him through the heart with a sword or a spear, or set him on fire, or let wild animals rip him apart. Not the sort of process anyone's going to walk away from. So, Jesus' death isn't simply a point of Christian doctrine, it's a fact of history, as even non-Christian scholars are happy to admit. Atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann declares that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. John Dominic Crossan of the infamous Jesus Seminar says that there is not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Marcus Borg, another member of the Jesus Seminar, states that Jesus' execution is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. Jewish scholar Pincus Lapid affirms that Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. According to Paula Fredrickson, a convert to Judaism, the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome reserved particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. And, as everyone's favorite scholarly critic of Christianity, Bart Ehrman, maintains, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. The real question, then, is whether Jesus was alive again later. How would we know if Jesus was alive at some point following his execution by the Romans? The same way we know many other things from history. We need witnesses, and we need to know that we can trust these witnesses. Do we have witnesses of the risen Jesus? Yes, lots. Fortunately, they began preaching almost immediately, and we have summaries of some of their early sermons. They issued official creedal statements that could be easily memorized and passed on to others. They sent out representatives with authoritative traditions, traditions that would eventually be incorporated into the Gospels and other writings. We also have writings and quotations outside the New Testament from the next generation of Christian leaders, which included people like Clement of Rome and Polycarp, who knew one or more of the apostles and who continued preaching the message of the apostles, especially the resurrection of Jesus. But the most interesting source on the eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus is an early Christian creed recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. 1 Corinthians was written around AD 55, and Paul says in the letter that he had already delivered the creed to the church in Corinth, which would have been around AD 51. But Paul received the creed long before that, either when he visited the apostles in Jerusalem or perhaps even at his conversion, and scholars date its formulation to within a few years of Jesus' crucifixion. James D.G. Dunn writes, This tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. According to Michael Goulder, Paul received the tradition, that is, he was taught it at his conversion, perhaps two years after Jesus' death. Ulrich Wilkins says that the creed indubitably goes back to the oldest phase of all in the history of primitive Christianity. Gert Ludemann maintains that the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. Paul Barnett dates the creed to within two or three years of the first Easter. Richard Burridge and Graham Gould say it dates 
From only a few years after Jesus' death, Robert Funk and the Jesus Seminar put it within two or three years at most. Richard Hayes says it originates within about three years after Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. And Alexander Wedderburn says that it goes back to the first half of the 30s. So, there's widespread agreement among scholars from across the theological spectrum that 1 Corinthians 15 contains very early material that can be traced to Jesus' original disciples shortly after his death. Let's read the passage. Paul writes, For I delivered to you, the Christians of Corinth, as of first importance, this is foundational information, what I also received. And here's where the creed starts. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time. Paul is writing this years later, so he adds parenthetically, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. The original would have ended with this appearance to all the apostles, but Jesus appeared to Paul later, so Paul adds, And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Notice what we have here. We have Jesus' death for sins, his burial, his resurrection on the third day, and numerous appearances. And we have all of it as authoritative tradition within a few years, if not within months, of the crucifixion. As for the appearances, there are appearances to individuals, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and eventually Paul, to small groups, the Twelve and all the Apostles, and to a large group, he appeared to more than 500. The list also reports appearances to both friends and foes. Peter and the apostles were followers of Jesus during his three-year ministry, but James and Paul weren't. James didn't believe that his brother was the Messiah when Jesus was preaching in Galilee and Judea, and Paul persecuted the church and tried to destroy it. Yet they're all listed as witnesses who saw Jesus alive again sometime after his death. This passage eliminates two skeptical responses to Jesus' resurrection, the legend hypothesis and the hallucination hypothesis. At the internet level, there are still people who claim that Christian belief in Jesus' resurrection arose through a process of legendary development over a period of many decades. But this is factually false. We know, as a fact of history, that the resurrection was the heart of Christian preaching from the beginning. You also may have heard people argue that Jesus' disciples simply hallucinated the resurrection appearances. But a hallucination, by definition, is something that occurs in the mind of the person experiencing it. If you take a bunch of acid and a leprechaun appears to you, the rest of us aren't going to ask him for his pot of gold because we won't see him. He won't exist outside your acid-tripping mind. But Jesus appeared to entire groups on multiple occasions, and hallucinations just can't explain repeated group appearances. So, we can't attribute the resurrection appearances to legend or to hallucinations. Can we attribute them to deception? Were the disciples lying about the appearances? That's what I thought before I was a Christian, but there's a fatal flaw in the deception hypothesis. Liars make poor martyrs. While some human beings are willing to die for what they believe in, I've never met anyone who was willing to die for something he made up. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested and threatened. In Acts 5, the apostles are put in jail and flogged. In Acts 12, James, the brother of John, is put to death by Herod, and Peter is again put in jail. The Apostle Paul describes his life as a Christian in 2 Corinthians 11, 24-27. He writes, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. 
Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. The Jewish historian Josephus reports that James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death as a lawbreaker. Clement of Rome invites his readers to keep in mind the sufferings and martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. So the apostles didn't just preach that they had seen Jesus alive again. They were willing to endure prison, floggings, and even death as they preached. And that means they really believed what they were saying. Here again, it's not just Christians who draw this conclusion. Even non-Christians maintain that the disciples sincerely believed that they had seen the risen Jesus. Gerd Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Bart Ehrman, we can say with complete certainty that some of his disciples at some later time insisted that he soon appeared to them, convincing them that he had been raised from the dead. Bart Ehrman again, it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. Paula Fredrickson, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus, I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know, as a historian, that they must have seen something. Fredrickson says that she doesn't know what they saw. But I do. I think it's obvious what they saw. The disciples saw the sort of thing that would convince individuals and groups, friends and foes, that they had all seen a man who had been dead, alive again, standing in front of them, telling them why he had to die and rise again. Unfortunately for our atheist friends, the only sort of thing that can do that is Jesus actually appearing to them, which means that Jesus rose from the dead. So, there's only one conclusion to draw from the facts that even atheist and agnostic scholars grant as historically certain. And yet, atheist and agnostic scholars clearly don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Why do they reject the resurrection when they're aware of the historical evidence? Different people will give different reasons for denying Jesus' resurrection, but if you do a little digging, Two broad issues emerge most frequently. First, many people have a prior commitment to naturalism. Supernatural explanations are ruled out before the investigation begins. And if supernatural explanations are ruled out beforehand, Jesus' resurrection is never even a candidate for belief. So, is a commitment to naturalism a good reason to reject the resurrection? As Alvin Plantinga and others have shown, naturalism as a worldview is fundamentally incoherent because it ends up undermining the reliability of the cognitive faculties required to affirm it. If naturalism is true, how did you obtain your cognitive faculties, the processes that produce your beliefs? There's really only one game in town if you're a naturalist. Your ability to reason is the product of natural selection acting on random mutation. Natural selection, of course, favors traits that help organisms survive and reproduce. So, if human reasoning evolved naturally, it's because it helped human beings survive and reproduce. Does this give us any basis for trusting our reasoning ability when it comes to questions of theology or philosophy or science? No. At best, our cognitive faculties would be reliable when it comes to finding berries or using a spear against an enemy or doing something to attract a mate. 
Interestingly, Darwin himself noticed this problem. He said, But with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Naturalism isn't a pillar of rationality, it's a pillager of rationality. But a more glaring difficulty, given a discussion of miracles, is the global abundance of miracle claims. In 2006, the Pew Forum issued a report titled Spirit and Power, a 10-country survey of Pentecostals, discussing statistics on Pentecostals and charismatic Protestants in the United States, Brazil, Chile, Guatemala, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, India, the Philippines, and South Korea. And the researchers found that approximately 200 million Pentecostal and Charismatic Protestants in just those 10 countries believe that they have personally witnessed miraculous healings. Imagine what the numbers would be if the study had included all denominations in all countries. In a 2022 article for the New York Times, Dr. Molly Worthen writes, Scholars estimate that 80% of new Christians in Nepal come to the faith through an experience with healing or deliverance from demonic spirits. Perhaps as many as 90% of new converts who join a house church in China credit their conversion to faith healing. In Kenya, 71% of Christians say they have witnessed a divine healing, according to a 2006 Pew study. Even in the relatively skeptical United States, 29% of survey respondents claim they have seen one. After reviewing a number of miracle reports from around the world, Dr. Craig Keener concludes, It is no longer plausible to tout uniform human experience as a basis for denying miracles, as in the traditional modern argument. Hundreds of millions of claims would have to be satisfactorily explained in non-supernatural terms for this appeal to succeed. While many may be so explained, one cannot adopt the conclusion of uniformity as a premise without investigating all of them. In other words, those who exclude supernatural explanations prior to investigation do so by faith, not because the evidence demands it. Second, it's perhaps even more common to reject the resurrection because of what the resurrection implies. If we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, we might think it's a good idea to listen to what he says. But Jesus said all kinds of things about sin and judgment and salvation, and if we don't want to take his teachings seriously, or if we don't want to become Christians, or if we despise anything that has any connection to Christianity, we kind of need to get rid of that whole rising from the dead thing. Now, this has always seemed like an odd approach to me. Decide what we want to believe ahead of time, and then reject evidence that doesn't line up with what we want to believe. And atheists normally condemn this approach. Suppose an atheist comes to you with some kind of evidence. Let's say he gives you evidence for common descent, the claim that all living things share a common ancestor. If your response is, well, I don't like what common descent implies because that would mean I'm related to pigs, so I'm going to reject any evidence you give me for it, the atheist will accuse you of being anti-science and anti-evidence and irrational and stupid and bigoted and so on. But then, if you present that same atheist with evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, you'll suddenly find that heaven and hell and the Salem witch trials and gay wedding cakes and all kinds of other topics are entering into his evaluation of whether Jesus was dead and whether he was alive again later. Feelings become the ultimate trump card. We obviously can't stop our atheist friends from smuggling their feelings about Christianity into discussions of historical facts about Jesus, but we can point out how ridiculous it is for them to claim to be the champions of reason and science and logic 
when their feelings and emotions have full reign over their reasoning. Now, there's other evidence that's relevant to this discussion, and there are additional objections to consider. But we already have enough to conclude that Jesus rose from the dead. All the available evidence tells us that Jesus died by crucifixion and that he was alive again later. Friends and foes were so thoroughly convinced that Jesus had appeared to them that they were willing to endure torture and death for the privilege of proclaiming the Christian message. The question for us is this. What could have convinced all these people that Jesus had appeared to them? This is the question I struggled with almost three decades ago, and I couldn't think of any explanation apart from the resurrection that could account for the historical evidence. By that time, I already knew that naturalism was a theory in crisis, and I didn't trust my feelings enough to reject facts I didn't like. In the end, I concluded that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, and that if I was going to listen to anyone tell me about God, it was him. <laughs>